In this video, we're going to be painting the Tully Cavaliers, and we're going to try and do red and blue in a not-so-Pepsi way, and we'll see if we achieve that at the end of this. So here is just my basic metal formula done through an airbrush. I've done it in a couple other videos, but I use the Vallejo metal colors, the ones that come in the bigger bottles. And uh, when I'm done with those, I like to do the washes to kind of get some of the definition back into it because that directional airbrush highlighting kind of takes some of that away. So I mixed P3's Armor Wash with GW's Drakenhoth Nightshade. And when I got finished with this, uh, it didn't really give me that bluish tinge that I wanted. It just kind of really turned out just more black. Uh, and then that weird, like, oil slick look that you get from the P3 wash was kind of lost. So you don't have to mix those two. But if you're looking for a really good armor wash, it would be P3 armor wash. Uh, also, if you're kind of looking for more videos on how to do metal, stay tuned because we'll be looking at painting flayed men with true metal instead of non-metal uh, so keep an eye out for that one but otherwise we're just kind of washing this model right now and uh, bringing those colors I, well originally I was bringing them more to like a tealish kind of theme because my my personal Tully stuff is instead of blue I use uh, teal and instead of red I use magenta so now we're gonna go in and do the body of the horse uh, I'm going with uh, the Mornfang brown base for GW mixed with uh, black to get the, the darker brown look. That Vallejo game color that I had put on there earlier, I was going to use it, but I decided not to because the Mornfang brown just mixes with black fine. So uh, the thing about cavalry that can get a little frustrating is that you're, almost, you're, you're painting two models at once, pretty much. So there's a lot of things to look out for. In a perfect world, this rider would be separate from the horse, and we could just do that on our own with him off, so we could be a little bit more um, wishy-washy when it comes to uh, priming the model. Like, I do the metals first through the airbrush because I really like the effect that I get out of them. But for the horse, there's, like, a buckle. I guess, like, they have their head armor, too, that comes up. But for the most part, they're not getting a lot of benefit out of having that done. So uh, we're just going through and uh, putting the base coat on. Now, this is going to have to be done twice if you're painting it the way that I am with the airbrush and everything, or having the metals airbrushed on it first, because those... uh the reflective qualities in these Vallejo metal color paints is really intense and uh, the paint doesn't go on in one real thick coat, right? You kind of have to, usually with the GW ones you can get there with one coat, those base, base tones because they just have a high pigmentation in them. But uh, over these metals, we're going to be seeing a lot of that reflective quality come through as we paint over it. So I'm doing things like the hair on this model as well because I'm not, I'm, it's not going to be brown in the end of it, but uh, I just want to kind of get started early on blocking in those colors. But also, if you don't know quite how to paint horses or what you want them to look like, uh, first of all, it doesn't matter. There's no, no uh, equestrian is going to be uh, scrutinizing your models. But you horses are pretty much like dogs when it comes to breeds, and I know I'm probably compartmentalizing when I say that, but there's a ton of different ways to paint, a, or t tons of different ways that horses look. So you can just go out there and do a quick uh, Google search and find different types of horses, and you'll they're all like kind of, they have their colors kind of tied to them for the most part. So you can find some cool breeds or something that might uh, bring some real interest to your models, especially if you're trying to use like, trying to pull your main colors into the horse's body too so like you can get some good contrast built up between the two for me blue and red uh the brown is kind of close to that red but we're kind of using a lot of the blue in this too in different spots so whenever when it all comes together you'll kind of see how it works but we've done a couple to uh, a couple coats of brown already on this model now it's all dried up for the most part you can see there's not a ton of the metal color showing through there's a little bit but with this uh, straight highlight of Mornfang brown uh, we should be able to uh, block out a lot of that shiny quality on this one in terms of the type of highlighting that I'm doing this is just kind of a really 
lazy version of uh, layering. So what I've done is the that black it, that black and Morn Fang mix kind of gives me the an easy transition from Morn Fang that darker mix to just straight Morn Fang, and the 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 viscosity or thin the the way I've thin my paint is just about a one to one ratio i think with the gw stuff it's more like two to one because those foundation paints or base paints whatever they call them now base paints those are pretty thick so you can you can thin them down quite a bit and still kind of get the the intensity of their color to come through so in a more traditional layering sense what you would be doing is thinning the paints down quite a bit and then kind of really being intent on pulling the color from the darkest point to the lightest point so that your brush deposits just a little bit of paint on the highlighted portion so you get this somewhat smooth-ish transition. So here we are back with the model dried and you can see I'm not doing anything with the tail or, or the mane at all on this one. That'll all be dealt with later but we're just going to be going through and putting a sharper highlight. Uh, this uh, color that we're putting on is Mornfang Brown mixed with uh, some Vallejo Game Color Leather Brown, and that's just to kind of really get these high points. I'm not going to be trying to do a whole lot of sweeping unless it's around the head area because a lot of that's going to be exposed to the sunlight. So we're, again, kind of, this isn't thin enough to really be considered what a lot of people would call like that true artsy layering. I'm really just kind of doing this like slap the paint on so I can get it on the table looking cool. Uh, but I still am paying attention to some of these highlights in terms of just trying to get them to blend well with the model. Now once this is all done, if you feel like there's too much separation between the colors for you, you can go back and wash the model down with a brown to kind of pull them back together. So this is where we were, I was talking earlier about the whole teal and pink thing that I was doing. So I'm going to be going through and just doing this uh, a different way. Well, I'm going to be doing it for, for blue and red. I'm kind of switching things up here. So we're going to go into a, a very small bit of color theory here, but in order to get a nice vibrant shade, most people when they're shading a model or trying to get a, a sh well get a shade for a model they end up just taking their base color and mixing it with black now that's not going to give you the greatest uh, return on having a nice deep fun looking shadow it's going to kind of drown out the color a little bit and look a little bit more misplaced so what the best thing to do in order to get a nice a uh, nice sweet shadow is to take the color that you're working with its basic color so this in this you know reality it's clotted red is what my color is so it's just red so in order to get that to sh have a sweet shadow I'm going to knock down one le level on the color wheel and mix in that with black and my uh, original color so I'm taking that clotted red mixing it with black and then mixing it with purple so that's going to give me a nice uh, cool uh, shade for this one without making it lose too much of its uh, vibrance like it's still going to be very red pointed and for the, uh, the the thing that I'm unfortunately unable to go over because I kind of switched gears on painting uh, in terms of the colors for this one is the kind of freehand work that I had done with the uh, the split in the cloth so I kind of made this weird like X pattern where part of it's blue, part of it's red. And I think I got that from their artwork uh, on the back of the card. But really when you're trying to do uh, a sharp line, the best thing to do is to start uh, pr pushing your brush down a bit elsewhere on the model to kind of see where the the flatness of where the flat edge of the brush is going to end up. And then you can just kind of drag that over slightly or drag, drag your line over, and now you can go back over and do some more, like, fun highlighting or, or just more reestablishing of that line. Uh, but before I get too far into that, we're coming in with the blue now, and this is the same concept. So one step down 
on the color wheel, color wheel for blue is going to put us in purple again. So we're still tying these two colors together with that purple. They kind of have that shared, um, that shared commonality or whatever. But and it's that's kind of why I don't like working with blue and red together on a model because they both are really closely related. And since we're shading into a more purplish black color. Uh, it's going to look a little similar. As soon as we start highlighting, it's going to look better. But I really like to go for a lot of uh, uh, in visual interest on models, and blue and red just doesn't quite get that for me. But um, the colors that we used here were GW's base Cantor blue, along with my scale 75 black, and uh, Vallejo, the purple that I used for all of this was uh, Vallejo Game Colors Warlock Purple, I think it is, or it's Lycan Purple. I can't remember the exact name of it. Pretty sure it's Lycan Purple. I could just go back and look, but hopefully the letter, the the wording for it came out clear for you. So, again, I I liked, I like kind of shifting the colors on Tully's a bit to that teal and pink instead of blue and red. It just makes the model look more interesting. But in order to keep with the house colors, because I just couldn't let that go. I decided to redo all of it and uh, go with this blue-red thing to try and beat the Pepsi trope. Um, so we're just going over a lot of the previous work we did to put that blue down. And with all that teal, it's going to show through. Uh, it's going to be hard for the metal to kind of shine through all that because I already did it once. So uh, if you are doing the, the metal prep that I had done here, just be aware that this is probably going to take a little bit. And when it comes to painting these folds with that line, as I've just kind of noticed on some of the blues, the lines are staggered a bit. And that's just because that's what will happen when the cloth folds uh, with the line. So it's just uh, you can pay attention to that if you want to. But for the most part on these models, I think there were only a couple that I really intently tried to uh, skew that line a little bit to show that there was some movement in the cloth. So now most of these colors have dried. I had to go back over the shield again and uh, and just kind of keep forging ahead on it while it dried because I knew it would be a while. So now we're coming in with just clotted red for the the first uh, highlight or what you would probably call a mid-tone. And you can see on that pill bottle top that I've left this stuff pretty thin. Now, one of the things I really love about the Reaper uh, paints is that their pigmentation is pretty strong. But even but so much to where you can thin them down not so much like the gw ones but you can take these pretty thin and they they have a really nice uh color that they leave behind so they're really good for this type of layering and here i'm probably getting a little bit more into what like a traditional layering style would be and it's really but because the red as it, red as a color in general for acrylic paints really lends itself to that because it does kind of come out a little more transparent when you're painting it so we're going through the first pass and leaving a lot of uh, shadow behind because I do want to get away from this super bright red and super bright blue that you can get on these models. I want them to be a little bit more uh, deep and not so much, like I said, Pepsi can looking. And with the little tassels on the, on the, the reins, uh, you, I just kind of picked a direction and went with it. I wasn't really sure kind of how I wanted the light to hit those. So it's you can either do like the top half, the bottom half, or on some of these I did like the sides. And then when we're getting into these areas like on the chest where there's a lot of uh, light that would be hitting that, we're going to do a real big sweeping of the red around there because we should be seeing a lot more red in those areas than that purple. So we're going to let this dry up a bit and then come back in and kind of reestablish the highlights that we did with the red. Uh, and that's going to kind of give us just another layer to work with. Oh, when you're doing this kind of layering where you're thinning down your paints quite a bit, I think for this one it was about two to one, uh, you can almost completely highlight a model with just two colors because these layers can just keep getting built up and up and up. Uh, and you see, if you compare when I did this the first time to what I'm doing now, I'm leaving a lot more of the uh, 
red from that first step behind. And that's just to try and shift these colors a little bit more to that clotted red with having a nice uh, smooth transition from that purplish red that we had done uh, so that transition doesn't become too stark. And we'll hit the shield here too. Um, I think with this one I went a little bit more thick. Now what I'm doing when you're watching uh, watching me paint with this, I'm doing a lot of strokes. That's really not what you want to do with layering because you could kind of skim or pull the skin of your paint off. So like the paint dries on the top first and then through the bottom. So it's good to wait a good long time for the paint to dry out. Uh, but what I did was a little bit haphazard here. So Mephiston Red is one of my favorite reds to use for these bright highlights. And what I'm doing to try and make this transition a bit more natural and less stark is, uh, first of all, because we're working with Tully's, haha. But uh, I'm mixing the Mephiston Red with uh, Clotted Red to make that first step highlight because the if I was to just go with straight Mephiston Red, the highlight would be too uh, exaggerated be too fast so I needed to kind of calm that color down a little bit since it is so strong and uh, just try and ease the transition with those colors uh, again if the transition for you is too much like the, the colors are not really blending well together you can go over with a red wash or glaze and just kind of pull them back into one another it kind of leaves a filter over them uh, and just gives them kind of just like I said pulls them back together to that color So now I've let this dry a little bit and I think that it's looking pretty decent the way it is But I am going to go straight on with Mephiston red and we're going to pull out some of these really high folds uh, Just to really show some dramatic lighting differences here. I, I wouldn't go too crazy with the Mephiston red on this one uh, just because we, we it is a super bright red so we do want to try and uh, keep some of the um, the difference between that purplish black that we started with and this kind of builds up like a dramatic shift, right? Um, so we still get that really like super red color, but it's not so like bam red. Uh, there's still like a lot of shadows left behind that kind of give it some dynamic white business, I guess. I'm not the greatest at explaining art terms because I'm not a, a traditional artist by any means. So bear with me on some of that. So now we're just coming in from that uh, dark mix blue that we had with Cantor Blue, and we're adding, this is just straight Cantor Blue. And again, it's the same process that we followed with that, uh, with Clotted Red once we had put it over our shadow color. Um, a lot, a good portion of the blues on this model is getting covered with that, and we're leaving some of the we're leaving the recesses behind. It's almost like the backwards washing, I guess you could probably call it, but it's just layering in the in almost every sense. It's just my layering for for models that I just want to get ready and on the table is a little bit more haphazard than than some other people would do. I'm I'm all about just getting my I'm I kind of walk that line between a model that looks good and a model that's quite uh, quick and easy to get on the table and ready to play. So this Cantor Blue is probably thinned about two to one. Again, those those uh, Citadel-based colors can be thinned down quite a bit before you start to break up the bonds of the, the binder and the pigmentation. So uh, it lets me, it allows you to do some pretty cool layering. You can already see that that blue is starting to take some shape but we've got that darkish kind of blue that makes me think of pepsi so we're gonna try and highlight that up a few a few more times without killing this model in the process or my camera so this is the what it's looks like all dried up you can see that there's less uh there's it's not so stark when the wet's when the paint's wet it's kind of lost some of its vibrance so this Vallejo model color, it's an old one that I've had, but it's good. Um, it's dark blue. Uh, if the, if you couldn't see the, the the numbers or the lettering on it at all, because it, it has kind of rubbed off over the years. But this is going to be uh, that Vallejo model color dark blue mixed with Cantor blue. 
And this, the Vallejo model color, it's strange sometimes, These the, the model color line. I'm, I know a lot of people enjoy it. I don't particularly care for much out of it other than their blues. But they really vary in uh, in their, like, consistency. So with this blue, it's quite strong in its pigmentation. So I thinned it down uh, quite a bit more than what I would almost any other color when I was mixing with that Cantor blue because I do want my transitions to be somewhat on the smooth side. I'm not trying to paint these really, like, bam, standout lines, you know? So we're just going over and, and getting most of the edges that would be hit by the light. We want to keep that deep shadow on here to show like a lot of complexity in this blue cloth, especially since we're kind of taking one piece of cloth and putting two different uh, things on it. You can see me kind of screwing around with the background here. I just wasn't really happy with where it was positioned, but whatever. Uh, so now that color's dried up, and you can see that's lost some of its intensity as well, but now we're going to bring that intensity right back with our final highlight of just straight dark blue. And this one stands out quite a bit. You can see that there's a lot of, uh, we're, we're kind of creating a lot more visual interest by having such a massive difference between the shade of the blue that we had applied and this final highlight of blue. So we're going to be, on the cape, we're going to be hitting quite a bit of it because it should be hitting a lot of light and some of the focus should be on the rider, even though I've put a lot more investment into the red and blue cloth on the horse, we do want to try and bring some attention to the rider as well. And you're just following around and making sure that you hit some high points on it and again you can see I've kind of chosen the direction that my highlights are going to go on those little tassels on the on the reins there and that does it for the the blue and red highlights on this model even the shield we've kind of got a really nice uh cool look and I don't think that it's looking too uh strange so now this is where things are going to get a little wonky where we're working with the white so that wave that's on the uh, shield i am going to follow kind of the the tully standard with having this be white instead of metal i just think it's going to look a little bit more cool and i do want to work white into some of these models because it is on their house sigil and you see i just totally jacked up that line because i wasn't painting quite the best so we're bringing in another person to work on this uh on these waves so the to get these done, I've thinned down the paint a little bit more than what I should. Usually when I'm painting fine lines like this or, or specific shapes like this, I try to get my paint a little bit more thick. And uh, with since this wave is raised up, uh, since you won't have a camera in front of you while you're painting these things, you can use the edge of your brush to make sure that you hit only the, the raised up wave instead of using the tip of your brush like I do. But now I've got to go back through here and remove some things. And if you do overpaint an area, just quickly wash your brush off and bring a little bit of water onto the model to kind of dilute that paint a bit more in the area where it went off. And uh, you'll be able to clean it up well. You can see that I did that here with the original model we've been painting. So we've got the, uh, the white mix of sh somber gray or shadow gray from Vallejo Game Color. Uh, mixed with wolf gray from them as well. And now with the white, I'm trying to be a little bit more delicate with the layering. And uh, this is just straight wolf gray now. And we're just going to be painting a, a large portion of the waves on that to kind of establish the, the white, uh, try and point ourselves to a nice white highlight without leaving too much dark stuff behind. So we're integrating a little bit of white into that wolf gray mix on this one just to try and smooth the transition to white instead of having it be again this really stark and dramatic jump and there's no real I think maybe there's the the GW contrast paint the apothecary white that could maybe help you smooth out those transitions if things get a little too wonky but you can see that I've just worked it up to white and then that's where we've ended up so this is kind of like a habit I don't think it really works well on this model but I'm using the Citadel Contrast uh, Tetradon something turquoise and uh, I use that to paint the scales so I've already done the scales in metal and this is a, f a fun trick for some of you who might be trying to do like green armor for Renly or any of his uh, uh, models for the Baratheon army is to pick up some of these 
certain GW contrast colors and try and paint over metal on them. It tints the metal a bit and uh, gives you a pretty sweet color that's left behind. Now, again, the teal thing that I've done here, that's more so a hangover from the teal and pink tullies that I normally have but I departed from that on this one, so I don't know if it works so well here, but I'm going to leave it alone anyways. So we're looking at doing the leather straps now. So one of the things you can do instead of what I'm doing here is that since we have a lot of red on this model, uh, we could have used black for the leather straps, and they would have stood out maybe a bit more and separated the model up a bit instead of kind of blending in with not only the hair on the horse, but also the uh, the red that's on the the model, like the, the red uh, um, little cloak thing that the horse is wearing. So I've decided to keep this one pretty thick so that I can make sure that the, the thin paint doesn't wander off on itself and go into places where I don't want it to be. I think this is like one-to-one -one for the, the Mornfang color. And I know that we used a lot of Mornfang to get the horse color done, but we're going to be stepping it up quite a bit in terms of the highlight to try and separate it out from the red because it is kind of blending in right now. And we're going to use uh, that Vallejo game color leather, uh, leather brown, to, to really drive home the highlights. But we're just, uh, it, it, I think, honestly, it probably could have done black and it would have looked better. In the end of every at the end of everything but I'm not too worried about how this all ended up turning out you're free to do whatever you want with it if you feel like well you might not even have brown horses I mean you might have black horses so it might make more sense or you might do the th same thing I did and paint your tully teal and pink and then they'll just look different we can't forget the little leather pouch on the side of the rider and the leather straps for the stirrups. So this is what they look like dried. They're, they don't blend in so much anymore. But now I'm, I'm not even paying attention to the whole thing I've been doing on the model otherwise where I would mix leather brown and the Morn Fang together. I'm just going to go for this really super bright highlight on the leather to try and get it to separate from the red and the brown on the horse a little bit. And I think it does a decent job of uh, standing out pretty well here. Uh, you're, as I said, you're you can mix and match your your paints as you see fit. But again, this is uh, a little bit more on the thick side. I think we did again a, a one to one mix of water or my thinning agent to uh, to paint. That way we can control where the paint goes instead of watching it kind of splay out all over the model if it was too uh, if it was too liquidy. Now we're getting on to the skin. There's uh, With the Tullys, their helmets are really uh, good at hiding their faces. With the Cavaliers in particular, there's two riders that have uh, a good portion of their face exposed with the mask on their helmet pulled up, or the face guard, or whatever you want to call it. So we're using my standby of Tindalos Red mixed with uh, Resurrectionist Flesh from uh, Scale 7 5 Fantasy line, and that gives us a nice... Uh, deep skin tone to work with and then we're really since his head is it's not very detailed to be honest with you and there's not a whole lot of it hanging out and a lot of the visual like cues aren't going to be pulling people's eyes to that face uh, so we're just going to be highlighting roughly like the cheeks and the nose with just straight resurrectionist flesh and then uh, moon harvester flesh is I think the other one that I grabbed and that one, we're just going to put straight Moon Harvester flesh on the very tip of the nose and the very tip of the cheeks just to uh, just to give a little bit of detail in, the, in his face there. You could wash this when you're done if you wanted to hit the recesses and the eyes a little bit more. And this particular model, I've also kind of like identified that it has a mustache. So I'm just using some Mornfang brown, Mourn Fang brown because it's what I had hanging around just to paint it down. And if you noticed, I, I did hit the hair off camera. So he, the horse has like a black mane and a black tail that we ended up doing. And with that, we're going to come in with black mixed with somber gray just to highlight. And I'm being really like haphazard with the highlights here, just drawing in some lines on the tail. 
Uh, probably a better way to do this if you can control the brush really well is to just dry brush over the model. Uh, just be mindful to not hit any other parts of it to mess up what you've done already. Um, as I get closer to finishing a model, I get a lot more sloppy. So my, my little hair highlights here are not looking super hot. Um, an easy way to kind of avoid this if you also get kind of, if you get kind of detail fatigue is to just go through and really like messy highlight like I'm doing right now and then just wash them the hair parts with black when you're done just to try and bring back some of those recesses if you might have painted into them and here we've got the final product all four of the Tully Cavaliers ready to go and crit blow and sunder everything around the table uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, uh, head on to our Facebook channel. I post a lot of uh, updates on painting and random things there as well. Uh, do subscribe to the channel if you if you enjoyed it, uh, and do hit the. It, also, if you subscribe, hit the notification button because I do post these videos uh, at weird times, and I don't always uh, spread them around Facebook real fast. I do post in most all the Facebook groups, so you should know when they come out but uh otherwise i hope you enjoyed this painting tutor tutorial and i look forward to making the next one for you